Our reading today comes from Mark's Gospel, and I'll be reading from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 down to, ooh, about 43, I think. Sorry, am I? All right, I didn't know which me. Uh, Two very familiar readings. Mark writes, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. While he was there, while he was by the lake, there then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My daughter, little girl, is dying. Please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressing around him. And a woman who <coughs> and a woman was there who had been subject to a bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she had been freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realised that the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Taliathem cum, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up, walked around. She was about 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. When I was a student over four decades ago, I was told that Mark's Gospel wasn't really worth studying. It had poor punctuation and grammar. It was written in a sort of a dialect, not good Greek. It was also written by, in a hurry, by John Mark, probably because he wanted to get everything he knew down quickly before he either died naturally or in an unfair competition in an arena with lions. 
And also, this gospel doesn't have those two great bookend events of the birth of Jesus and his resurrection. Although it's an easy gospel to read, it's not one that you tend to, would tend to give to people because you want people to read those two great stories. But over the last decades, views on Mark's gospel has changed. And scholars have realised that Mark's gospel was far better written than they first thought. It is a great gospel to study. It's not like a story that you would read in the Cornishman about a, the report of a garden tea party. But you need to understand the geopolitical, socio-religious situation and the way in which Mark juxtaposes these stories. Today's very, very familiar reading from the New Testament intertwines two stories and one reflects the other as you go through. And it unfolds like a four-act play. In the first episode, Jesus come, Jairus comes to Jesus because his daughter, his pride and joy is seriously ill. Sickness is a great interrupter of life. It enters without knocking. It thwarts all plans. It mocks our ideas of certainty and diminishes our hope in the future. This is a significant moment for Jairus. In the psyche of his time, wealth and position were interpreted as signs of God's blessing upon you. Rather like there are some branches in sort of in America really, who use the prayer of Jabez in the hope that they will become very wealthy. Well, on the other hand, illness was considered a punishment for unatoned for sins. So this is a com complete confusing moment for Jairus. Here is wealthy, well-recognised man with a poorly daughter. You see, Jairus, from what we know of him, was rich and important, the leader of the local synagogue. He was the sort of person who would ring up his local MP and say, shall we meet for coffee on Thursday morning? And expect the MP to say where and at what time, rather than speak to my secretary until I find a window in my diary. And it was with this sort of authority he walks straight up to Jesus, exuding the confidence of an important person. But when he meets Jesus, he does something quite unusual for a person in his position. He falls at Jesus' feet and asks if Jesus would, Jesus would come to his house and place his hands on his daughter that she might be healed. He seems to be grasping at straws at this moment, you know. He doesn't quite have the faith of the centurion or the widow of Nain, believing that Jesus only had to speak and a miracle would happen. But it was a moment when, G G sorry, when Jairus realised that he was totally out of his depth. Despite his wealth and position, he realised he couldn't cope in his own strength. He needed Jesus. He realised that it was only Jesus who could solve the problems he was facing. He knew he had to surrender to Jesus. So Jesus followed Jairus to his house. And on the way, the scene changes. Jesus and the crowd that always seemed to be with him started out and followed. 
And in that crowd was a woman who was very, very ill. But unlike Jairus, this woman had no status in society. Not only had she lost control of her health, she'd lost control over her identity, she'd lost her place in society, she'd lost her, her, all her resources, she had lost and unlike Jairus, she didn't have the confidence or the status to come and face Jesus. So she approached him from behind. But unlike Jairus, she had the absolute belief that Jesus could and would heal her. So in her absolute faith, she reaches out and touches Jesus' clothing. Suddenly Jesus turns round because he had known someone had touched him in faith. For the many people like that, there are those who say, Jesus has inspired me to live a good life, to be generous with my money and my time, to help anyone who might ask me for help but have never reached out and asked Jesus to touch them to change them to forgive them to make them a new person forgive them not just for now but for an eternal future changed from the inside out not willing to lose personal self control and give up everything to accept Jesus in their lives. But it was only at that moment, when she realised that she couldn't remain anonymous, does the woman have the confidence to stand before Jesus and look him in the eye and hear Jesus say to her, Daughter. Notice that he calls her daughter. She is no longer a um, face in the crowd. Daughter, your faith has healed you. And she too now is driven to her knees. What drives us to our knees before Jesus? Yes, we might have had that moment when you realise that there is someone bigger and better than us when we are not the centre of the universe. We may have had that moment when we know that our needs to be remade, renewed, restored have been answered by Jesus. We might have been driven to our knees in a state of awe and wonder of what Jesus has done for us. That the creator of the universe should know and care about us, care about me, so much that Jesus should die in such a painful and lonely way because he loved me so much. But can you visualise that scene of that crowd around Jesus? Could we place ourselves somewhere in the crowd? Very close to Jesus, there would be the ultra-Orthodox Jews waiting to pant upon any breach of custom or theology. Isn't it ironic that some of these people in the crowd thought they understood God and God's ways better than the Son of God himself? And sometimes Christians can't be like that. Christians should be open to the possibility that on some issues they may not be right. And then there were an, another group in the crowd who were just basking in the reflected glory of being with Jesus so they could go home Afterwards, and say in those famous words of Max, Max Boyce, I know 
because I was there. But there were others who were there just because there was a bit of excitement going on. And you find that amongst Christians. They hear there's a, a movement in the spirit at Great Rubblestone Chapel. And they leave their own chapel in hope that they might get in on the action somewhere. But in that crowd, there was only one person who reached out to Jesus in faith. For to Jesus, there's no such thing as unclean people, just people that need his healing touch. It reminds us also that you can never tell the stories of Jesus the stories of how much God loves the world without considering the poor and the people who are on the fringes of society. We all may have our prayer list, whether it's written or in our mind, but how often do we pray for the people on the fringe of society, the people that others ignore? We see in the Gospels that so often it's the poor who are most willing to receive the good news of Jesus. But the rich need it also. But sometimes wealthy people, people of status and importance, may have too many layers around them of money and prestige and friends to protect them from hearing the words of Jesus. The poor have nothing. What I also find deeply challenging in this, and in all others of the healing stories, is the compassion of Jesus. I get, I'm very challenged by this, because when he does something, he doesn't expect anything in return. He doesn't say to this woman, I think you should join the embryonic church. He doesn't say, I think you should change your lifestyle, tidy up your act a bit. He just said, go in peace. He expected nothing in return. Then we move into the next scene. We are getting close to Jairus' house when the friends of Jairus come and say, don't worry, unfortunately the girl has died. Now Jesus challenges Jairus to demonstrate faith. Just the sort of faith the woman had. So he enters into a scene of chaos and confusion. He tells those people mourning to be quiet. She's only asleep. And he's met with the same reaction that later he's going to get outside the tomb of Lazarus. Then into scene four. And Jesus takes the parents and his three closest disciples into the room where the girl lay. He takes her and commands her, Talafai kum. Now Peter must have been very impressed by this, you know, because later on, when he comes into the same situation, he holds the hand of a lady called Dorcas, and says, Talathai kum, which means woman, get up. And she too is raised from the dead. Remember that despite these miracles, these are resuscitation miracles. These people will at some stage die again. There is only one person who died and rose to life forever. Then Jesus says something very strange to the parents. Don't tell anyone. How could they not tell people that suddenly their daughter has been raised from the dead? Because the miracle is not the miracle. The real miracle in this story is that Jesus can forgive sins. Jesus changes lives. Not just for now, but 
eternally. Despite being diametrically opposed on the social scale, there is one small little detail that unites both of these women, something that might have been overlooked. And the detail that unites them is the number 12. The daughter was 12 years old. The woman had been suffering for 12 years, the whole of the girl's life. And of course, 12 is an important number in Jewish theology. It was the 12 tribes of Israel that established Israel itself. Jesus told, chose 12 disciples, the new covenant, the new Israel. Now being 12, this girl was old enough to be betrothed, to be married, whatever we might think about it. Because she had a rich father, she could expect an excellent husband. Because she would be provided with an excellent dowry. And her husband would be wealthy also. And she would, he would provide her with an excellent home. And she would be the lady of the house. She would have children who would be well brought up. And well educated. And when she walked down the street, others would nod in respectful envy. Remarking on what an excellent wife and mother she was. But on the other hand, the woman had been ill for 12 years. She'd lost all her money to quack doctors. She had lost her family to a repulsive illness, making her ritually unclean. She'd lost her home and would probably have to live in caves. And when she walked down the street, people would ignore her or quickly turn away from her in disgust. For the intertwining of these two stories, of the young girl and the woman, there is another story of rich and poor, righteous sinner, pure and outcast. They're all wrapped together in a single story. For there is no correct way to come to Jesus. The synagogue leader did it what he thought was the correct way while the outcast woman sneaked up from behind. But they both came to Jesus in need. For whether we are rich or poor, we can reach out and touch Jesus. Whether you consider yourself righteous or a sinner, you can reach out and touch Jesus. Whether you're spiritually healthy or unwell, you can reach out and you can touch Jesus. But the question in the end becomes a personal one. Have you reached out and touched Jesus? Because as we have some, just one touch from the King changes everything.